everybody and welcome to this uh, webinar on chronic pancreatitis where we're going to discuss both medical management and uh, enzyme substitutions. Uh, this webinar is being hosted by the India Pancreas Club. The Indian Pancreas Club is an organization which is, uh, has a membership of all doctors who are interested in the field of pancreatology. It's uh, been there for some time now and currently it's being rejuvenated uh, it's a very active club, which has a lot of activities going on in terms of webinars like this. And also those who are interested in research in pancreas, those who are in the field of diabetes mellitus, those who are in the field of endoscopy, ERCP or US. For all of them, it's a common forum, which is going to be extremely useful. In fact, it's also a part of uh, the uh, Association of uh, Pancreatis, uh, Pancreatologists, uh, International Association of Pancreatologists also and uh, loose association with other pancreatic clubs around the world. So I think it's a very important uh, association for those who are interested in uh, disease in the pancreas. I would strongly suggest that you become members of this. You can uh, send your queries to Dr. Pramod Garg later on. So, so he'll send you the forms and so on. Now, the second uh, part of this uh, program is going to be on pancreatic enzyme substitution for those who have chronic pancreatitis and deficiencies in pancreatic enzyme. Uh, for addressing these two questions, we have two very eminent uh, doctors who have sort of worked in this area for a long time, who are known both nationally and internationally. The first part of the topic, chronic pancreatitis, medical management of the pain, is going to be done by <laughs> Dr. Uh, Pramod is a uh, professor of gastroenterology with special interest in pancreas at the All India Institute of uh, Medical Sciences. He is, of course, one of the most well-known, internationally well-known in the field of pancreas. In fact, uh, he is also the secretary general of the International Association of uh, Pancreatology, contributed extensively in this area, and I think it's a real pleasure to have Pramod here. So we'll start with Dr. Pramod Ka speaking to us on chronic pancreatitis, medical management of things. Uh, th Pramod? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Reddy uh, and Dr. Ajay Kumar for having invited me to this uh, to give this talk. Uh, Dr. Reddy, as the president of Indian Pancreas Club, I mean, it's an honor to have you as the moderator for this session, sir. So without wasting any time, uh, let me begin uh, with the talk that is on medical management of pain in patients with uh, chronic pancreatitis. Now, uh, I have divided my talk into certain subsections. Uh, first, apprise uh, the, the listeners about uh, the chronic pancreatitis that we see in our, in our country. Uh, how does it develop? Because that has an impact on the management strategies. And finally, how do we manage uh, uh, chronic pancreatitis? Now, if we look at how uh, we'll see how a normal looking pancreas like this will ultimately become like this, uh, atrophic pancreas, dilated duct, multiple calculi. Now, uh, India has the dubious distinction of having the highest prevalence of chronic pancreatitis in the world. It is around 75 to 100 per 100,000 population, uh, which is much higher than other countries. Now, if you look at the chronic pancreatitis in India from a historical perspective and current status, um, if, if you see, many of the uh, talks will contain pictures like this, where you have a markedly dilated pancreatic duct and multiple large calculi uh, throughout the pancreas and most of the talks you will at least from India you will find these pictures showing that this is the kind of disease that we see again on MRCP a hugely dilated duct multiple large calculi on a CT with atrophic pancreas but I just want to tell you that this is only a very small part of the problem these are the patients who have very advanced disease this does not mean that this is the type of pancreatitis that we see and a historical understanding of chronic pancreatitis came from Kerala, where a more than 1,000 patient series was reported by Dr. G. Varghis initially, who showed that it affects young people who are mainly malnourished, 90% of diabetics, and have large pancreatic stones. So this is the kind of patients he described, malnourished male, consuming cassava, large stones, hugely dilated duct, requiring insulin uh, for diabetes control, and they die very early in the course of the disease. And he, he said it is pain in childhood, diabetes in adolescence, and death in the prime of life, and termed as chronic pancreatitis. A very important seminal paper. The question is, is it true anymore? Do we see the same phenotype or the phenotype is different? So there are multiple uh, 
characteristics of chronic pancreatitis described earlier. So let us see them, <clears throat> which are important ones. So in a study of 411 patients, we found that 59% of our patients had idiopathic chronic pancreatitis and alcohol was about 38%. Now, similar data have been reported from various parts of the country, including AIG Hyderabad, Chandigarh PGI, SGPGI, uh, similar data. If you look at the age of onset, we found the age of onset of disease was 24 years in our series, uh, and most of our patients from Northern India. A series from Kerala showed mean age of onset 30, and from Chandigarh, 33 years. If you look at malnutrition, we found that in a study of 224 patients, 75% were either normally nourished or overweight, only 25% were malnourished. On the other hand, about 35% lost weight following the onset of disease, suggesting that malnutrition is an effect of the disease rather than a cause. Cassava is uh, only of historical significance, and I'm not going to discuss its role. How about diabetes? So we found only about 36% patients having diabetes in our series. From Cochin, it was 59% and Chandigarh only 23%. That means uh, not all patients have diabetes. How about the life expectancy? In a study, we found that the probability of surviving for 35 years after the onset of chronic pancreatitis was 83 years. And mind you, the onset of disease was at 24 years. That means majority of our patients, more than 80%, are likely to survive till the age of 60 years and probably longer. So this is a very important study, my tribute to Dr. Balakrishnan, who published a paper in 2006, showing that the mean age of onset in Kerala, where the original disease was described, increased from 20 to 30 years over a period of 20 years. BMI increased from 16 to 20. Majority of their patients who were poor earlier, now they were in middle uh, uh, socioeconomic status, and diabetes was lesser at 59%. So... If you look at the perception about the disease in India and what we see now, there is a difference. So tropical pancreatitis was described earlier as a special type of CP, young age of onset, cassava consuming patients, severe disease, malnourished, almost all diabetic, and they die very early. Now what we see is mostly idiopathic pancreatitis, alcoholic pancreatitis about 35 to 40%. We see both young and old patients, they don't consume cassava. They are both early and advanced disease. They are not malnourished and diabetes seen only about a third of patients with a reasonably good prognosis. And I want to emphasize on this good prognosis. And I think Dr. Grady would also emphasize that later during discussion. So I think we need to continuously question ourselves to understand the change in the disease pattern and phenotype, not only for chronic pancreatitis, but for other diseases as well. And what they say for good signs, you need to be a skeptical empiricist uh, as proposed by uh, Nicholas Taleb in, in his uh, celebrated book, Black Swan. So, so far I've described the change phenotype of the disease in India. The next question is, why has there been a change in the phenotype? And this is mainly because of the economic development. So this is a slide which shows that the in the state of Kerala, and we are, I'm focusing on Kerala because that's where the disease was described initially. The state GDP in 1970 was $320 million it increased to $13 billion over a period of 30 years. And commensurate with that, the, the per capita income increased from a mere $15 to about $525. Now, this tells us about a 40-fold increase in the income of people. And that's the major, major uh, uh, factor which resulted in a better uh, uh, phenotype and the, and the disease outcome. So if you see here, this is the national state GDP which is increasing uh, uh, over a period of time. And along with that, the age of onset increased from 20 to 30, the BMI increased, and the prognosis improved of these patients over a period of time. So we believe that this is the reason. And you see this picture, they say, is worth 1,000 words. This is the picture provided to me by Dr. Ramesh of a patient in early 70s. And this is a picture provided by one of my students from Kerala. You can see the difference in their overall phenotype and the socioeconomic status. You can see a painting hanging on the wall at the back. So what I have just enumerated is a change phenotype of the disease in India. And by and large, I would say that the disease seen in India is similar to that seen 
across the world. And the reason I'm emphasizing this point is what we do and say is applicable elsewhere and what they do and see is also applicable uh, in India. Now let's come to the mechanism of pain in patients with chronic pancreatitis because that's the main crux here. So this is a 30 year old male patient came with incidental diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis, large stones, no pain. And that's important. And this is a patient who had very early changes of chronicity, little bit changes in the main duct, significant pain. So the point here is there is no definite correlation between the morphology that you see and the pain of the patient. Now, when you talk about chronic pancreatitis, immediately people think about that it's a disease which requires endoscopic therapy or surgery because there is a dilated duct, because there are multiple stones. And the assumption, main assumption here is that it's a duct-centric disease. Now, why this issue came up? So people were doing this endoscopic therapy and doing a sphincterotomy and taking out stones. For example, in a bile duct, you do sphincterotomy, take out the stone. You have a stitcher in the bile duct and you put multiple stents here and the patient does well. So similarly, the same argument was put forward for pantry duct that look, here is a stone in the pancreas duct, which is dilated, there seems to be obstruction. So what you need to do is to do a sphincterotomy, put in a stent, take out this, this stone, and the patient would be fine. The problem is that we often forget as an endoscopist that outside this pancreas duct lies the whole pancreas, unlike the bile duct. There is no parenchyma around the bile duct. And the problem is not limited to this duct, problem is limited, is all around the pancreas. The multiple calculi, there is disease in the parenchyma. And if you look here, the disease starts actually from the SNR cells. That's, that's an important concept I want to give before we move on to the therapy part. So this is an endoscopist or a surgeon's viewpoint where you say the disease starts from the, from the, from the uh, duct and you need to do something for that. But we actually see the disease where a patient has large stone and a mercury dilated duct much later in the course of the disease. So the first question is how does it develop and is it a duct centric disease? So pancreas has both the duct and the parenchyma here. The parenchymal cells, the SNR cells, so all the etiological factors, whether it is alcohol, smoking or mutations, they all work on the SNR cells, not on the duct cell, except perhaps in the case of a CFTR mutation where the disease may start in the in the duct cells, but mainly you see the SNR cell which get affected, leading to inflammation, injury, and other problems. So about a quarter of patients who develop first episode of acute pancreatitis will develop recurrent pancreatitis, and about half of them will go on to develop chronic pancreatitis. So if you see this, we studied a 75 patients with recurrent pancreatitis, and 47% of them developed chronic pancreatitis over a mean follow-up of about five years. So this is the the, the paradigm, if you look at the progression of the disease in the parenchyma, a normal looking pancreas here, subtle changes, and then you see changes of chronicity with calcification and atrophy. And if you see the ducts, normal duct, then slightly dilated duct, and you have markedly dilated duct. So this is how the disease progresses. So the end stage or the advanced disease is seen much later. So this is the paradigm of the progressive model of the disease of acute to recurrent acute and chronic. Now, let me just say here that there are about 10 to 15 percent of patients that we see at a stage where they have already advanced disease without a precedent history of acute or recurrent pancreatitis. But that's a minority and we are not going to discuss that issue today. So this is the spectrum of disease, early disease moderate disease and very advanced disease, large stones, atrophic pancreas, and mostly burnt out disease. In our study and a study from PGI, we found most patients presenting with recurrent pancreatitis or early pancreatitis. In PGI study, 53% had non-calcific pancreatitis. So this is the second, in the second part, I've showed you the concept of progressive injury leading to chronic pancreatitis. And it is years before patient develop a dilated duct or pancreatic stones. Uh, Dr. Reddy, I can stay, uh, stop here for a minute before I go on to therapy if there are any questions related to this part of my talk. So, no, we're just getting it in. Uh, I think this is a very important concept that uh, promotes this, in fact, this concept of changing from tropical pancreatitis to idiopathic uh, pancreatitis. 
from india is very important i think uh, there there are a lot of uh, questions coming in maybe one or two will uh, take up um, this is one of the questions were was from sudesh no uh, sishir sharma and he wanted to know whether uh, you have shown us how chronic pancreatitis actually acute recurrent progresses to chronic pancreatitis so is there any markers biochemical markers which would uh, you can actually do to follow this because the etiological may not be always easy so i think that's a very important question that are there any biomarkers to decide whether the patient has already developed chronic or not now let me tell you from a conceptual point of view as of today we say it's chronic pancreatitis only when there is a calcification or a ductal dilatation but if you look at those patients who have recurrent acute pancreatitis and here are the patients who do not have say for example gallstone disease we know that these are the patients who are ultimately destined to develop chronic pancreatitis it is just in the earlier course of the disease that a patient has come to you with chronic with with recurrent acute pancreatitis rather than chronic pancreatitis so take them as someone who is likely to show up later uh, with chronic pancreatitis we would like to have a good biomarker unfortunately we don't have a good biomarker at this stage to say it is likely to be chronic the only thing which could suggest that is an underlying genetic predisposition so suppose you have a patient with acute acute pancreatitis or a early chronic pancreatitis and you find that he is spink1 positive or he has a major cftr mutation it is likely that this patient is going to develop chronic pancreatitis thank you ramadin in fact continuing on that there is a question that you have been involved a lot in the genetic aspect of chronic pancreatitis uh, but uh, in this particular thing you didn't uh, touch upon this maybe it's too long a subject to actually go yeah, into yeah yeah i, yeah, I, I didn't want to go there yes yeah. okay so then i think okay. we we'll continue the management okay. and then we'll get so uh, then we come to the management of chronic pancreatitis and uh, so how do we treat our patients so there are major three issues one of them andrew discuss about pain and dr rajesh kumar is going to discuss about uh, cystorrhea and enzyme supplementation diabetes we generally manage in consultation with our endocrinologists so i am not going to discuss that uh, today so this is the spectrum of disease and mechanism of pain that i have just showed you you have early disease the disease starts from snr cells they have significant pain in about 5 years they develop this moderate to severe disease they still continue to have pain uh, which is recurrent or sometimes even continuous and the again the the problem is in the snr cell but at this stage some of these patients have uh, obstruction in the duct and that may also lead to pain and finally you have a burnt out disease hardly any pancreas left you have multiple large calculi and most patients do not have fortunately pain they have steatorrhea they may have diabetes some of them may have pain but that's neurogenic in origin that's neuropathic pain so cp primarily is not a duct centric disease at least for the initial 5 years or so and it's the medical intervention medical treatment and not interventional treatment that is required during this period that's what i would like to emphasize now what are the things that you need to know before you treat a patient initial assessment so we need to know the parenchymal status and the presence of calcification or calcula basically the same thing Uh, whether the pancreas is sufficient or there is now pancreatic atrophy setting in i think ct scan is the best thing for that the ductal status is dilated there is a stricture uh, that's best seen on mr cp is there an inflammatory mass because inflammatory mass is something that creates a lot of problems that is best seen on a contrast scan ct the nutrition status of the patient is the patient malnourished does he have uh, vitamin deficiencies i think this needs a very important assessment and dr reddy is a proponent of nutrition assessment in these patients uh, and uh, and and he vouches for nutrition therapy in these patients and and then we have to look at other complications for example pseudo says biliary obstruction portal hypertension because these things will decide our our overall strategy in managing these patients so coming to the medical therapy first thing you need to do is to stop alcohol and smoking even in patients with idiopathic pancreatitis if they take social alcohol or smoking we do not know the additive effect of these toxins i think best to advise them not to take either alcohol or smoking analgesics for pain relief is generally we start with nsaids or paracetamol and for chronic pain or recurrent pain opioid analgesics particularly tramadol and we tend to avoid morphine although i know in the western countries they they often use morphine but we would advise not to use morphine and then we come to enzymes uh, dr rajakumar is going to talk about that antioxidants and then further up interventional therapy
Now, enzymes might help in pain relief in many patients. There are various mechanisms, but I'm not going to discuss the issue of enzymes. But suffice for you to say that some patients do benefit with enzyme, and that's why we prescribe uh, these patients, even if they do not have steatorrhea. And Dr. Ajay Kumar is going to talk in detail about. Now, coming to antioxidants, so that's the next therapy in, is antioxidants. So uh, there are many sources of oxidative stress in patients with chronic pancreatitis. Uh, these are exogenous, like xenobiotics, alcohol, smoking, and also endogenous. And that is why there is a lot of oxidative stress in the pancreas of patients with chronic pancreatitis because of environmental factors. But also now it is shown in those who have got genetic mutations that they have oxidative stress and endoplasmic reticulum stress in the cells. And we have shown in, even in earlier stages of recurrent acute pancreatitis that there is increased oxidative stress and a deficient antioxidant levels in patients with early CP or recurrent acute pancreatitis, which could also be important in the pathogenesis. So we performed a randomized trial uh, about uh, 10 years ago on antioxidant supplementations. A similar trial has come from AIG Hyderabad also. So we divide our patient to intervention and placebo group and give them a cocktail of, um, of antioxidants. And mind you, uh, the reason I'm showing this slide is that often I find that people prescribe suboptimal doses of antioxidants. Now, that's not a good thing. So we need to give proper doses. And this includes two gram of methionine, a vitamin E, organic selenium, vitamin C and beta carotene. And we gave it for six months. And we found there was a significant reduction in the pain in these patients in terms of number of painful days per month. And also about a third of patients actually became pain free uh, for one year uh, after supplementation with antioxidants. <laughs> UK, which was published uh, about six years ago, uh, which uh, showed that in 33 patients who were given antioxidants, uh, this was not effective. It was a negative trial. But you see, 70% of those patients continue to drink alcohol, and that is 20 drinks a day. They were smoking 21 cigarettes a day, and they were on a mean of 85 milligram of morphine per day. And I wonder if they could respond to a cocktail of antioxidants. So to my mind, no benefit I've actually expected out of those, out of that trial. So this is a typical prescription of medical treatment for a patient with chronic pancreatitis. Diet is very important. We generally prescribe 1500 to 2000 calorie diet, which is a homemade diet. In fact, we did a randomized trial of homemade diet and a MCT, medium chain triglyceride supplemented diet and we found no difference. So a normal homemade diet is good enough for these patients. We generally prescribe small frequent meals, four to five meals a day, because there is often a meal pain relationship in patients with chronic pancreatitis. That means following a large meal or a prolonged fasting, they often develop uh, a recurrence of pancreatitis. So it is generally advised to give small frequent meals four to five per day, stop smoking and alcohol. We generally prescribe pancreatic enzymes to almost all our patients because in the hope that it might help in their pain and also possibly some subclinical malabsorption or maldigestion. And we give them antioxidants in adequate doses, which I've shown you. Uh, the normally whatever combinations are now many brands are available. So you should give either one TDS or two TDS. Analgesics, we give tramadol and we avoid morphine and some patients require pregabalin. So there's one study published more than a decade ago from, from Denmark, which showed a pregabalin in a very high dose of 150 milligram twice a day could be beneficial in those patients who do not respond to standard therapy. Subsequently, there was a study from Hyderabad AIG where pregabalin in addition to antioxidant was shown to benefit patients who had failed both surgical and or endoscopic therapy. So pregabalin may be required in some patients who have continuous pain or recurrent pain or those in whom we think it is likely to be neuropathic pain. So if a patient doesn't respond to this optimized medical therapy and the trial should be given at least for three to six months, then 
we advise endoscopic therapy, which is not I'm going to discuss today, but just suffice me to tell you the prerequisites for endoscopic therapy are no response to optimal medical treatment, dilated duct, and a ductal obstruction. Now, if, and, and this is the protocol you can follow with pancreatic sphincterotomy, stenting, followed by ESWL or ESWL followed by ERCP. So both the protocols are followed. <clears throat> In patients who do not respond to medical or endoscopic therapy, then they may go for surgical therapy. Uh, again, the prerequisites here are dilated main pancreatic duct, large stones, and in some patients, a head mass. And they often go for LPJ, lateral pancreatic jejunostomy, with or without resection. Most often nowadays, most surgeons will require, will advise resection, either a formal Whipple's, limited Whipple's, or a head coding, a phrase or Bager's procedure. A recent trial published early this year in JAMA, escape trial showed that early surgery may be associated with better outcomes of faster pain relief compared with later surgery where you have an endoscopic medical therapy, endoscopic, and then surgery that they step up approach. So they showed early surgery may be better, but I think uh, we need more data uh, before we can say that. So coming to the summary part of the medical management, the treatment depends on the stage of the disease. Patient present with recurrent pancreatitis has early disease, mechanism of pain is inflammation, possibly oxidative stress, the treatment is medical and no endoscopy or surgery is advised at this stage and the large majority of patients will actually come at this stage. Then you have patients coming in at this stage, they have some calculi, they have a mildly dilated duct, they have recurrent pancreatitis or sometimes chronic mild pain. The mechanism again here is inflammation and in some patients ductal hypertension and these are the patients in whom following medical therapy intervention in the form of endoscopic therapy or surgery should be advised. And this is the third stage, the advanced end stage disease. Most patients do not have pain. That's a burnt out disease. Some may have a chronic neuropathic pain. And again, endoscopic or surgical therapy in those who have neuropathic pain does not uh, benefit these patients and they may require medical therapy, including, as I said, pre -gabalin. So what happens to these patients when we treat them with this step up approach of optical medical therapy and interventional therapy. So this is the data of we published a couple of years ago uh, where patients, we had a patient, 288 patients, 52% responded to medical therapy alone. And they were patients of all grades of severity of chronic pancreatitis. About 17% require endoscopic, they responded to endoscopic therapy. And about 7% responded to surgical therapy when they failed both medical and endoscopic therapy. Overall, 84% patients had significant pain relief at the end of one year. Only about 16% continued to have a recurrent pain or chronic pain. Now, when we looked at their overall long-term follow-up, we found that the proportion of patients becoming pain-free on follow-up increased with the duration of disease. And if you follow them for 10 or 15 years, about 70 to 80% will have a burnt-out disease. That means there won't be any pain. They will have other complications, uh, but not uh, much of pain. So what are the predictors of response? So these are the predictors which we found suggest that patient is unlikely to respond. So for poor response, patients who are young, and these are the patients who have preserved parenchyma. The, there is not much atrophy of the pancreas. Those who continue to smoke on alcohol and those who have an inflammatory head mass, these are the patients who have poor response to your therapy, all kinds of therapy. So I'm coming to the last slide of my presentation. Uh, this is the summary. Um, I've just shown you uh, the change in the phenotype of the disease in India. I've shown you the concept of progressive injury leading to chronic pancreatitis, and it's years before patient develops stones and dilated duct. And it's not a duct centric disease, at least for the initial five, six years. Optimized medical therapy, including antioxidants, enzymes, and nutritional therapy help more than 50% of patients that they do respond well. International therapy, in addition to medical therapy, is effective in up to 84% of patients. But there are patients who do not respond. And there we need more effective therapy. And for that, we need to understand the, the more pathophysiological mechanism, how chronic inflammation or recurrent inflammation keeps on occurring in these patients. Uh, our, our understanding is still not very good. And I think we more. We need more data. Thank you very much for your patient listening. And I hand over the mic to Dr. Reddy. 
thank you, Pramod, for that brilliant lecture as usual. I think uh, went to certain very basics and then explained it so nicely. We have a lot of questions coming in, but what we'll do is we'll wait for the second talk and then get back later to have both the questions because we have some common ground. Now, pancreatic enzyme in insufficiency is something that is very common with chronic pancreatitis, but unfortunately, very less addressed by gastroenterologists and even physicians. For some reason, it's something which is not very common in our regular practice. Look at this very carefully. Uh, this is a very important area because we now know that morbidity, mortality to a large extent may have relations to this uh, in patients with chronic pancreatitis. To address this topic, we have uh, with us Dr. Ajay Kumar, who is the director of the BLK Gastroenterology Institute and is also a very eminent gastroenterologist, past president of uh, uh, the Gastroenterology Association of India and has done considerable work in this area. He is going to talk to us on management of chronic pancreatitis, the pancreatic enzyme insufficiency. Ajay? So we have Ajay Kumar uh, coming on to discuss this with us. And I think uh, Ajay is uh, connected. So I think as yeah, Ajay is coming yeah. on, Samod, I think uh, what we'll do. Yeah, one or two questions. Uh, I know Ajay may cover part of this. This is the role of enzymes in pain. Uh, there are some people asking uh, what is the role of enzymes so, to manage uh, pain. There have been about uh, six randomized trials uh, looking at the efficacy of uh, pancreatic enzymes in relieving pain. Uh, most did not show any benefit of enzymes for the relief of pain, but two studies uh, showed some benefit. And what was shown is that those who have early disease and not very advanced disease, those uh, um, the female patients and those who are taking non entry coated enzymes responded better compared to placebo. Now, one of the things you need to understand is that it is the protease content that is important rather than lipase content when we talk about pain relief due to enzymes. Because the hypothesis is that the protease actually causes decreased release of uh, pancreatic Zeus formation and, and its secretion into the duodenum and thereby may decrease the pancreatic ductal pressure. This hypothesis has not been proven, but that's the basis. Since Dr. Ajay Kumar has come up, I think we can. Uh, okay. Thank you. Ajay, can you hear we, we are just can you hear introduced me? you to the audience. The topic. Yes, yes, I can yeah, hear Can you hear us, Ajay? Yeah, so I think uh, we'll have this topic, very important topic of pancreatic enzyme insufficiency. Uh, you can go ahead. Uh, we're waiting thanks, just Nagi. Well, friends, after such a brilliant talk by Pramod, it's not uh, easy to follow such a great uh, speaker uh, and a master and original research worker on the subject. The task, task is to talk about pancreatic exocrine insufficiency in chronic pancreatitis. Before we... Uh, can we have the next uh, slide? How do we go to the next slide? Yes. Go back. Yeah, okay. slide is on. Can you go back one slide? Hmm. Yes. See, insufficiency of anything is an inability of an organ to perform its normal function. And what is the normal function of pancreas in addition to the endocrine function, which we all know that it... Uh, uh, secretes insulin and has an effect on blood sugar. That is the exocrine function, which is to break down complex foods to simple nutritional building blocks. And this is reflected if there is an insufficiency that is reflected in excess stool fat with or without symptoms, reduced fat soluble vitamins or osteoporosis. And this insufficiency surprisingly occurs only after the 90% of pancreatic function is lost. I, though it's not a part of the topic, but I like to introduce a new term which is evolving near the next slide. Okay, sorry. I think I, so between normal pancreatic function and exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, there's a new term which is being coined not fully accepted, that is the exocrine pancreatic dysfunction. And people have been describing it as something analogous to chronic kidney disease 
versus renal insufficiency. And still we do not know whether it is harmful, but at the, at this, the way the things stand today, this is not a candidate for pancreatic exocrine replacement, enzyme replacement therapy. And these pancreatic deficiencies has been staged into different stages. And if you look at this table, the last stage three is which is comes into exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, where we have a coefficient of fat absorption less than 85%. And that is the stage when you require the pancreatic enzymes. Pancreatic juice is comprises of amylase, protease, and lipase. But what is most important clinically is the fat maldization. That lipase deficiency occurs at the earliest and it is less compensated by other digestive enzymes. And if you look at this particular thing, it's actually a timeline of chronic pancreatitis. The bottom thing shows when the pancreatic parenchyma is atrophies, goes down, and the pain intensity also goes down. But what goes up is the steatoria and lipase requirement. I'm not, I'm not able to put the arrow there, but that's a, uh, it's a very nice uh, diagrammatic representation how the natural history of chronic pancreatitis evolves. And when we talk about exocrine insufficiency definition, then we also say that when the lipase goes less than 10% in this slide is saying that that's what we call as a severe pancreatic exocrine insufficiency. We need to define severe. The reason is that these are the patients who are symptomatic for exocrine insufficiency. And that's what they're labeled as a word exocrine insufficiency. In these patients, lipase secretion is less than 10%. Quantitative fecal fat is more than 7 gram per day and fecal elastase is less than 100 microgram per gram of stool and the triglyceride breath test shows less than 29% and coefficient of fat absorption is less than 93%. All these tests which I'll talk briefly later on are the ones which we label is a severe pancreatic exocrine insufficiency. People believe there's another term of what we call is when the patients are not symptomatic and it is labeled as occult, which the, uh, before we reach the severe part, and that's what we call as a overt occult asymptomatic. Here, the fecal fat uh, is less than 15. They are asymptomatic. But here, people believe that there is a, a retinin binding proteins which are increased, and this is irresponsible for increased cardiovascular risk and also there's the increased osteoporosis. So some people are making it a case for that to treat pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, one should not be relying only on symptoms, but to look at these parameters as well. But still, as the things stand today, the clear-cut indication for replacement therapy is the overt exocrine insufficiency and not the occult but there is a strong case for treating occult as well. Now, there are a number of causes. I will not go into too much details. I like to say that the diseases which inhibit the secretion, chronic pancreatitis is current topic, is the, one of the most important causes of exocrine insufficiency. Of course, pancreatic cancers, post-pancreatectomy, upper GI surgeries uh, can cause impaired mixing, and can cause that even celiac, Crohn's, Zollinger, Allison, and severe necrotizing pancreatitis is another indication or another uh, uh, situation where you can have exocrine insufficiency. There are a number of trials from India to talk about burden of pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, and there the data is almost similar to what you find in the chronic pancreatitis in the Western population. So when we have a known patient of a chronic pancreatitis, how do we diagnose exocrine insufficiency? First question comes is how do we uh, suspect from the patient's symptoms and signs in the right clinical setting? 
the high likelihood setting basically means you will know that the patient has chronic pancreatitis and then you start looking at the symptoms and then you uh, have put it in a way that a highly most sensitive to less sensitive from top to bottom but what are the symptoms which will make you suspect in a known patient of a pancreatic disease that patient has exocrine insufficiency uh, abdominal discomfort bloating diarrhea flatulence and steatorrhea and weight loss in the setting of alcohol and smoking abuse or a family history of pancreatic disease but if you look at the, all these symptoms they are not exclusive um, part of pancreatic disease or a uh, exocrine insufficiency they can occur in number of other gi diseases and that's the reason that has been put at the least sensitive but in a given patient of pancreatitis is not losing weight and has steatorrhea that you can see the fat globules in the toilet you start suspecting so the clinical symptoms have a very poor reliability because they are subjective they are affected by diet and the opiate based painkillers influence bowel function and there are similar symptoms in other gi disorders but when you suspect you also assess them for other vitamin and a mineral deficiencies per se so when it comes to directly on the test as i said the top in the list from the sensitive point is the direct pancreatic function test all of us have uh, heard about secretin stimulations cholecystokinin stimulation and combined thing and they are done by different methods by putting the tube in the duodenum and collecting the juice or by endoscopically method and so on but what is common in all this that none of these is available in india even in the west where they are available they are basically restricted to the research labs they are cumbersome and they are not standardized so practically they do not have any clinical role the indirect pancreatic function test though may be less sensitive than the direct pancreatic function test but they are the more relevant there will be the blood test stool test or the breath test and out of these today we'll be talking about which are more clinically relevant is a 72 hour fecal fat collection qualitative stool fat or a fecal elastase which is the most important test in today's time and of course 13 carbon mixed triglyceride te breath test and which we'll briefly touch upon a dual test of 72 hour fecal fat collection after a challenge of 100 g per day of fat and we all have done 3 to 5 days and this shows that fat malabsorption if you find more than 7 g per 100 g of stool per day and the sphere is more than 15 g and from 7 to 15 uh, and the coefficient of fat absorption which is estimated from that should be less than 93% to uh, and less than 85 to actually market sphere but less than 93% to market a exocrine insufficiency but these are very cumbersome inconvenient and more, none of the private clinical labs to my knowledge is carrying out these tests only the big institutes like all india to promote lab is doing that test pgi used to do it i'm not sure whether they're doing it but there used to be a lot of jokes around it how the samples were misplaced and nagi will remember how the th stories happened about the foul smelling stool bags lying and being replaced by the other patients names and so on and a lot of us would have heard the stories about that because it is actually a, uh, for the person who is testing for the patient who is undergoing it's a real cumbersome that's the reason it has not got the fancy of the people but otherwise if you look at it this is one of the most important test it is also important for the different reason that in contrast to the other test that we use fecal elastase this is the one which you can use to assess the effectiveness of replacement therapy as a follow up you cannot use the fecal elastase as a follow up therapy follow up thing fecal elastase basically it's a proteolytic enzyme with minimal gut degradation and fecal concentration is five times higher and fecal less than 200 microgram is considered abnormal and when it is less than 100 it is a severe exocrine insufficiency till 5 years back this was also not available but now most of the uh, labs are pro uh, providing this pr uh, uh, all over the country of course it is expensive but it is to be done only in the beginning and not as a follow up 
So that's the reason it could be affordable. But if patient has gross symptoms, then you don't even need this to before prescribing the replacement therapy. But if there is a uh, borderline, then I think, or it's a research protocol, then you must do it. And um, in a post-pancreatic surgery, in a follow-up, it is not affected, so it's not a reliable test. So if you compare advantage of fecal elastase over fecal fat is basically a spot stool specimen. If you are not to correct it over a long time, it is not affected by dietary fat intake and it is not affected by oral enzyme replacement therapy. So it's a pool sensitivity, almost 96% and specificity is around 86%. The simpler alternative to fecal fat estimation is a spot test on a qualitative and quantitative Sudan 3 which is a reasonably good test, but some or the other, it has not got the fancy of the people and it's also not easily available outside the uh, labs which are actually doing it as a regular research lab. The most actually evolving thing will be the C13 mixed triglyceride breath test, which is a particularly, a, it's a basically C3 substrate combined uh, with the triglycerides and when the C certain metabolites go into the liver where carbon dioxide is excreted and it is breathed out and that you test uh, uh, the uh, CO2 for there and less than 29% indicates pancreatic exocrine insufficiency and that is a high sensitivity and high specificity. And if you compare with fecal elastase, it has a very good significant sensitivity and specificity comparison. But fecal elastase is cheaper and easier to perform, and most of the laboratories do not have the triglyceride breath test. I'm personally not aware if any lab in the country is doing it. Pramod can correct. Somebody has started doing this test. But MTBT is more accurate in operated patients, and it is also relevant in the post-operative or a post-treatment uh, post follow-up to assess the effectiveness of the PERT. Morphological test of a uh, uh, CT, MRI, MRCP in the US, they also correlate well with pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, especially when you look at calcifications, main pancreatic dilatation, then more, more than 80% probability of exocrine insufficiency. And so is endoscopic ultrasound. Different scores have been evolved. Calcification, main pancreatic irregularity, and visible side branches are the strongest predictors of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. So when we discuss all these pancreatic function tests, what it comes to the brass tags that in day-to-day -day clinical practice, we end up relying on symptoms and signs, high likelihood settings that patient is having chronic pancreatitis, morphology on CT, MRCP, and US. And whenever it's, uh, can get it, the fecal fat is a very good test if can, uh, somebody can set up a 72 hours lab or is spot staining. And fecal elastase, though expensive, but it is pretty sensitive and specific in moderate to severe chronic pancreatitis. And we in our day-to-day -day practice have There wasn't there. No, it's not frozen, only Ajay's. Ajay? We just wait for a second uh, for Ajay to come yeah. in. Pramod, as yes, Ajay is coming yes. in again, can you hear me? Yeah. So there's yeah. actually we have a huge number, more than 200 questions. I don't think we can go yeah. through this, but maybe we can do an email later. But uh, uh, there's one of the questions that are being asked is regarding uh, genetics. You know, should we do so, a genetic testing so, for all so the it's patients? It's a bit difficult question. So, chronic pancreatitis. Uh, as a general policy, I would not recommend to do it in every patient. For research setting, surely yes. But there are situations where we will recommend doing genetic testing. So, for example, a patient comes in with recurrent pain or chronic abdominal pain, and you're not sure what it is. Now, sometimes doing a test will help you establish a diagnosis and also allay the anxiety of the family. 
uh, that now we know that there is a risk factor, strong risk factor, and that is causing the disease. Uh, other than that, uh, in, in families where there are multiple members affected, uh, we can advise genetic testing. Uh, but now the trend is actually shifting towards more testing. Uh, so we can discuss about that. Later. Dr. Ajay has come back. Yeah. Yes. Uh, did I cover this? Yeah, 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 back slide? Again. Oh, okay. In the Indian no, no, scenario, the the practically went. what we are uh, looking at, clinical symptomatology in the right clinical setting and the morphology of CT, MRCP and US. And wherever it is available, do the fecal fat, wonderful test, is a more cumbersome and a, a lot of people not popular with the patient and the technicians. Fecal elastase, we have been start depending more on fecal elastase recently. It's a good sensitivity in moderate to severe chronic pancreatitis. Direct pancreatic function tests have a limited availability, technical difficulty, and more of a research protocol. And in our country, I don't think it is available at all. C13 breath test, promising, and need to set up in more, more facilities. But I, to my knowledge, is not available. But if it is available, that will make a good uh, test. When we talk about the treatment part, I think before we talk on the specific enzyme replacement, we must baseline assessment and also on follow-up, you need to assess the patient's body mass index, look at the vitamin uh, deficiencies, and look at the micronutrients of magnesium and zinc and B12 and folate levels. And that is what we will be going to follow up to assess the effectiveness of replacement therapy. As I said earlier, the indications of replacement therapy, I'm reiterating again, are document, uh, the definite accepted is an overt exocrine insufficiency and a borderline indication will be of an over, uh, occult enzyme uh, insufficiency. Diet, when you are given the replacement therapy, you have to go on no fat restriction. But more there's already talk about good homemade feed. We, we were earlier focusing on medium chain triglycerides. They are good because they don't require the pancreatic juice for absorption. But uh, question, they are available in coconut oil and a palm oil. But then uh, uh, one needs to change the diet pattern for that. But when you are giving the replacement therapy, you strictly speaking, you don't need to restrict the fats. You can go on the normal fats. An ideal replacement enzyme replacement therapy, pancreatic enzyme replacement preparation, should have a high enzyme content, it should be stable, it should have a long shelf life, it should be acid resistance, and terry coated, it should well mixed and distribute with chyme in the stomach. It should have a fast liberation at the pH of 5 to 5.6, because that's what you find in the duodenum, and particle size should be small, 0.8 to 1.2 millimeter. And available per preparations in India are different type. The recommendation is we should be using anti coated mini microspheres, which are the best suited for that. They are released at the right level. You see, if you look at the total uh, lipase secretion after a meal, that comes in lakhs. But that is not exactly you need to substitute the whole lipase for that. The reason is, I mean, the, as a, let's go back to what we talked earlier, that your 90% of pancreas is damaged before they actually present with a clinical exocrine insufficiency. And so you don't need to supplement the entire because there is a lipase available in the gut and all which is responsible for digesting a lot of fat. So the, what we give is about 25 to 40,000 units for major meals and people believe that you start with 25 and you build up according to that. And your three major meals, you give it 25, three, uh, uh, three times a day. And for each snack, some people will say you add 10,000 to 25,000 units. And question is, what time? There has been a number of trials and uh, that whether you give before meal, during meal, after meal, or you combine that some dose you give before, sometimes you give middle, sometimes after. There has been a good trial to show that it is uh, effective both ways. And if you are giving small dose, then you better think to give it in the middle of the meal. If you have to give the large dose, you can divide that, give one third before, and you can give uh, one fourth before, for half the dose in the middle, and one fourth in the last. And that's what is uh, some data to show that they are more effective. And how you assess the response, I've already told you about the test, 
but most important to check the patient's clinical symptoms and the weight gain and weight gain and steatorrhea are the best ways to follow up these patients and of course you will also supplement the magnesium and zinc in between as is required and keep on checking the magnesium and zinc levels now there will be after giving the good dosage there will be a significant number of patients who have suboptimal response how do we go about that first and foremost you check the compliance and then you can decrease the fat intake if somebody is taking more most of the patients don't take that much fat but you can decrease it to 50 to 70 g per day if somebody is consuming more check the expiry date or the storage conditions and then you check the compliance whether they are taking it the right way with the food and other than that then increase the dose and maximum that dose that you go to is an 80000 units in a day and uh, uh, add so 80000 units at time and add medium chain triglycerides because at least that can be digested by the intestine and lipase so patients will not have a lipase def- uh, uh, f- fat deficiency and simultaneously you look for concurrent gi disorder and uh, for that there are certain other additions that you can do you know acid environment is uh, uh, high acid environment is not good for uh, pe- uh, uh, for pert and so if you add a ppi in non responder sometimes they work every pert does not require a ppi it's only in the non responders that you will add and the second thing you need to rule out is the sibo because significant number of them may have that if you can do the uh, uh, testing with a jejunal aspirate or a breath test you test that even if you are not having the facilities for that go for treatment with an antibiotics if they are improving then you know that they have associated sibo while we are treating the exocrine insufficiency don't restrict yourself to treating the enzyme replacement please look at the collateral damage patients may have a deficiency of calcium magnesium iron zinc folate and vitamin b12 which should be supplemented and so is the fat soluble vitamins that is a d e and k and these should be measured at the time of diagnosis and early thereafter i'm not sure how clear this slide is is an algorithm that how do we approach as i said you diagnose the sewer pi based on the tests and the clinical findings and then you start per 25 30 thousand units of lipase per meal and consider adding 10 to 20000 for the uh, snacks and then you do the nutritional supplementation and then you ensure lifestyle modification that no alcohol no smoking and cessation of uh, uh, and the he- and the healthy diet and a normal fat diet and then you assess at 6 to 12 weeks on the clinical symptoms nutritional assessment and the stool um, uh, 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 if you can do the uh, stool fat that's the best thing if you have a availability of a breath test and then you do the mixed triglyceride breath test if there is a good response you continue that if it is an inadequate response again you go back and check the compliance and you look at the correct dose and uh, timing or you have the other interventions of a ppi or you have a uh, treat for sibo or look for sibo and treat it and otherwise change over to the medium chain triglycerides and so on and the end of it try a jugad that switch the formulation sometimes it works uh, thank you very much i hope i have stuck to time and i try to cover up thank you very much nagi over to you uh, thank you ajay for that very extensive excellent talk on you emphasized on the occult uh, occult uh, disease how it should be diagnosed also the regular diagnosis and the current uh, treatment uh, that's available for the disease and a nice flow chart to show how patient should be followed up actually we have i think the testimonial to this excellent talks are the more than 200 questions that we got during this period but unfortunately we don't have the time so what we'll do is we we'll limit to three questions each for each of you so that i know we'll have to end this program another 10 minutes so pramod we'll start with you there are uh, one of the questions that keeps coming on and on always is so, antioxidant um, therapy how long should we use what we typically do is to give it for 3 months in initially and if we find patient responding we continue for about 6 months in the trial that we conducted we gave it for 6 months 
Now, whether or not we continue it afterwards is not known. What we do is we give it for six months and stop it in the hope that patient and we advise them good nutritious diet, which is very important. And we hope that they will they will have adequate antioxidant defense. What we are now currently doing is to measure the levels of the antioxidants and the oxidative stress on a regular basis and trying to see if we can titrate the dose. We will come up with some data, but we don't take time. For the time being, I would recommend give it for three to six months and then stop it. If after a year or so patient comes back with recurrence of pain, you can again give it for about three months. Thank you. And then regarding uh, the timing, you're giving the patients analgesics and they say he's not responding. So tramadol is, to we tramadol? generally advise again, on an SOS long? basis that uh, whenever patient has pain, he can take it. He can take up to 100 milligram three times a day. Usually we advise 50 milligram SOS. That means two or three times a day. And this can continue for the period of, of pain. Now, normally most patients who have recurrent episodes of pain, the pain lasts for five to seven days. But there are patients who have continuous pain, type B pain, as they say. And these are the patients who have inflammatory head mass. Now, in these patients, we generally do not recommend a very long term opioids because then it causes more problems. So we would like to admit such a patient, treat him conservatively with nail, nail by mouth, IV fluids, analgesics in the hospital. And after a while, they do better. Thank you. And the last, actually, this is probably the most difficult question and common in practice. If you have a patient with pain, non-dilated ducts, not responding to... So, so you have said right the beginning, it's a very difficult situation. So what we typically do, and I think this, this works in most patients, is that you should admit this patient. A patient who's continuing to have pain, it's a continuous pain, non-dilated duct, may have an inflammatory head mass or inflammation around the pancreas. You admit this, hospitalize this patient, Nil by mouth, give him IV fluids, give him analgesics as well as in the hospital. Make sure he doesn't have any opioid addiction. Make sure it is not a neuropathic kind of pain. And most patients, you will find they respond. Also rule out any associated problem like a pseudocyst in the head of pancreas, which may not be very large. It is only three, four, five, six centimeters, but it is situated in the head of pancreas that may require intervention. Uh, if someone continues to have pain, that is recurrent, very frequent pain, I think for the time, we will have to live with it. Uh, but reassuring the patient is very important. Dietary manipulation is very important. There are some other certain uh, experimental drugs which can be tried, but I wouldn't advise that. And I have not dealt with total pancreatectomy because I am not a proponent of total pancreatectomy and auto eyelid transplantation, so I wouldn't recommend that. No, no, no. Thank oh, you, because I, that I seems to be the fashion of the now. Uh, way of Everybody gets impacted to the Will you recommend that? <laughs> Nagi, I'll put the question back to you. Will you recommend yeah. this total pancake attack? So thank you very much. No. no, that's what Pramo is saying, that he's not for it. And I think it's a not only a difficult surgery, but a difficult post-surgical situation to control. These patients are extremely difficult. and. We don't know how much is the neuropathic and uh, the supradentorial part acting. Thank, thank you very much. So, so thank you, Pramod, for those very nice answers. And Ajay, we have for you a very practical question that somebody has asked. Uh, so we ask us to give pancreatic enzymes for supplementation. Now, how long should you continue? Because these enzymes are very costly. You can't ask the patient to take See, life the, long. Uh, when what the do patients do? develop exocrine insufficiency, I mean, I think they don't go back from that. I mean. Uh, they will probably require. I understand this practical issue of the cost, yeah. but actually, it is something like that. Is if you have a, uh, a deficiency of controlling blood sugar, blood sugar, you need medicine for life now, and that's what happens in this because the pancreatic parenchyma is not going to revert back uh, to normal. Yes, this is a practical issue. Most of the patients cannot afford it in our setting, so we try to find some schemes for them to uh, make it affordable. We take care of the pharmaceutical companies to compensate for that but that's a uh, problem and the only other substitute is that they shift on to the medium chain triglyceride based diet which is not easy to comply with but uh, that can probably minimize the dose of uh, uh, birth that is required and the second question is 
uh, what tests are you using in clinical practice for pancreatic enzyme ins- insufficiency? So in practical One terms, we, are, see, we do not have access to the 72 hour or a, uh, five days fecal fat estimation. So we are, uh, uh, our lab, our hospital, we have just requested them. They will be started doing the Sudan 3 staining, which is uh, more of a more qualitative, less quantitative. But fecal elastase, because uh, uh, it is not to be done very frequently, so it costs about uh, most of the labs cost about four to five thousand rupees. It's time done once. It's expensive, but still, uh, that's what we will do. But if I have a patient who has a frank steatoria and who has a clinical symptoms, weight loss, I will not even go for the testing. I'll start the treatment. Okay, thank you. That's that's I think very important that what Ajay has emphasized that we, if a patient has clinical symptoms and you don't have to test, you can directly start because. Uh, sometimes it's so obvious that you don't have to really test for that. And the last question is regarding diabetes, which we haven't touched, of course. Somebody wants to know about the relationship between diabetes, pancreatic enzyme insufficiency, and uh, the other manifestation of chronic pancreatitis. So, so when you treat these patients uh, for pancreatic insufficiency, there's a feeling that diabetes also improves. So that is that so in clinical practice? Uh, evidence, and uh, I think the group is a fond of talking about the crosstalk of exocrine, endocrine crosstalk. And uh, there is a significant evidence that when you treat these patients adequately with exocrine insufficiency, and then uh, diabetes control improves. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I think that, that's No, the, I just wanted to so say thank that, you, Ajay, you know, for those, the yeah, control, please, sometimes yeah, the classic yeah, control may actually go haywire because if you have better pancreatic enzyme, better absorption, it might worsen. So one has to be very careful uh, in, in doing that. Yeah, so different crosstalk between this. So I think we come, in fact, uh, we have very nice questions, a lot of them coming in. We can spend another long session on this, but I think we come to the end of this session. Uh, we'd like to thank the speakers for the extraordinary talks, both Dr. Ajay Kumar and Dr. Pramod Garg. And again, on behalf of the Indian Pancreas Club, I invite all of you, the viewers of this, to join the Indian Pancreas Club. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. Thank you, Dr. Ajay Kumar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr.